Thank you, Matthew. Hi, everybody. Happy March. I hope you are enjoying this rainy, weird weather we've been having. Um, welcome to March's webinar. Our topic this month is going to be called Beyond the Table. So let me share a little bit about this first before I go into my own personal introduction and some of the objectives of what is in store for you today. Every month, every year, I should say, every year, the um, Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, which is a membership organization that houses the credentialed registered dietitians like myself, they honor the month of March as National Nutrition Month. And every year they have a specific theme related to nutrition in some way. And so this year, this year's theme is called Beyond the Table, which is going to be highlighting a variety of different things with sustainability in mind and also making you just generally be more mindful about the foods you consume. And even some things that we maybe want to take into consideration about the foods that we might be wasting as well. So here are some of the things that we're going to learn in today's conversation about the for farm to fork or farm to table, as it's sometimes called aspect of nutrition. We're going to talk to you about food safety and storage, because especially in the older adult population, there could be some immunocompromised people out there who have to be a little bit more mindful about what kind of foods they're eating and if their food is being properly stored. So I'll give you some hints and tips about how to manage that. Various ways that we eat, both in behavior Behaviors and also the actual foods that we're consuming. And then finally, some sustainable measures and how to decrease food waste so that we're not being wasteful and that we are taking into account the planetary or the environmental effects of what we are consuming. So just some housekeeping first. Obviously, this session is recorded, as you might have heard when you walked into the session. You can use the chat box or the Q&A feature at any time. As I go through the slides, I'll do my best to keep an eye on them, but I'll try to pause every so many slides and check. But we're definitely going to have some time for Q&A at the end of our discussion. And as always, while I am a dietitian. I am not your dietitian. So please make sure that you're getting proper medical advice and clearance from your doctor before you engage in any kind of new form of food or physical activity or any kind of medication modifications that you might be considering. So an introduction, because this is National Nutrition Month, a lot of us might have met already in our past webinars, but let me give you a little bit of a deeper insight into what a registered dietitian is or does. All of the stuff that you see in here is stuff that I've been doing in the last eight years of being a dietitian, but to become credentialed as a dietitian, because we also have, we have a, um, a, a national, nationally recognized holiday <laughs> next week. It's not federally recognized, but it's a nationally recognized holiday called the Registered Dietitian Day, which is next Wednesday. And so to become a registered dietitian, and you might also hear this term interchangeable with the word new nutritionist, but the registered dietitian is an actual protected title, like a registered nurse. So we have to go to school for many, many years. In this case, we do require us to have a master of something. So I have a master of science in nutrition. Then we have to uh, ad adhere to a year long application process and supervised practice within an internship where we get placed in a variety of different locations like a nursing home or a public school and a hospital and a community health center. And then we do some food service um, supervised practice. And then we do some research stuff as well. So we get a wide variety of where nutrition can play a role in so many different places and roles and responsibilities that a registered dietitian can do. After that internship is done, side note, uh, we do have to pay out of pocket for it. It's not something that we get money for, unfortunately. So it's treated like a year of school, extra school. After we are done with that internship, we got a verification to say that we are allowed to now take our board, national board exam. So we have to take and pass that exam, which is good forever, as long as every five years we maintain continuing education units. So that means I have to attend clinical conferences, I have to read research articles, I have to be involved in some way in my community, and all of those things are accrued as activity points or continuing education units. So it's really an investment in a lot of blood, sweat, tears, time, energy. And uh, if you know of anybody who is interested in becoming a dietitian, we would love to have you because our profession is about 110,000 people strong in the United States. And if you compare that to the rest of the healthcare world, I would say there's about 1 million medical doctors, general, general practitioners, 
and about 2 million registered dietitians. So with 110,000 of us, obviously we're not able to meet one-on-one -on -one with everybody. It's very much one-to-many. And so sometimes a lot of other healthcare providers might step in and play the role of providing nutrition guidance to their patients, but they are not specialized or qualified to do so. So here is where I'd like to advocate for my profession and our specialty. So if you are getting information from your doctor or a nurse practitioner, and it feels a little curious or it feels like they're telling you um, to completely avoid something, I would definitely say reach out and see if you can get referred to a dietitian that can better encourage you and feel, maybe meet you in the vicinity of where you might be at in a more realistic way, a sustainable way as well, so that you're not feeling like you have to give up your favorite foods just because you're managing a particular chronic condition like diabetes or kidney issues, et cetera. So thanks for letting me get on my little soapbox there. And here, we're going to begin our conversation. So the information around this farm to fork discussion about sustainable eating habits, I want to clarify a few things because sometimes we hear language like seasonal foods and locally grown. So I just want to share a little bit about that. And also I'll get into in the um, slides coming up, I'll get into some of the discussions about, is it true? Are certain things quote unquote, better than other things. So the seasonality of food really means that the crops are going to be providing you with the produce that is available year round or during certain seasons. And depending on where we live in America, like, you know, we don't grow apple, uh, I should say oranges here in New York state, but we do grow apples here in New York state. In New Jersey, we have things like blueberries and corn and tomatoes, but we don't have avocados that are native to us. So seasonally speaking, sometimes things are more fresher or more available to us during certain times of the year being the seasons. And in that case too, they're usually a little bit less expensive as well because they are readily available versus having to be packaged and stored and put away and then brought out year round. So sometimes seasonal food would be considered quote unquote fresher or tastier or more nutritionally dense because it's right out of the ground or wherever the tree, whatever we're picking it from. And so it can seem like it could be more fresher, tastier, and nutritious. But that is not to say, and I'll share a little bit more about this coming up, that if something is picked right out of the gate and immediately flash frozen or canned or stored in some way, there is still nutritional quality to that. Not everybody has access to farmer's markets, green markets, or very, very fresh food. And so we want to make sure that we're honoring whatever feels right for you, whether it's a convenience item or something that is a fresh produce item that it's going to suffice. Also, if you do opt to do a farmer's market or purchase more locally where you're going to your, you know, maybe green market on a Sunday, uh, down here in the East Village at Tompkins Square, we have a Sunday farmer's market. And then a few days out of the week in Union Square, we have a farmer's market there too. A lot of vendors. And we're talking people who plant and grow things like kale and lettuce and different kinds of produce. We also have vendors who have bees and procure honey and then package that for you to take home with you as condiments. We also have people who do bread, so they grow grain and then they also manufacture and produce those products as well. So you're helping support the economy and you're helping support the local farmer because it is quite costly if you've ever looked into this to be a farmer, it is quite costly to maintain their farmland and to get what they need as far as credentialing is concerned to be able to make food and deliver it to the to the general pop, uh, population in the community. But yes, it can be a little bit more costly because obviously you're buying from a smaller retailer versus these larger stores that have the ability to buy in bulk and then pass on the savings to you. But I'll talk a little bit about that too as to why you might not want to buy things in bulk, especially when it comes to food waste. So where to buy, I mentioned things like local farmer's market. If you go onto the internet and you go onto grownyc.org, I believe believe it is, you can type in your zip code or you can pull down a menu and it'll give you the different boroughs of New York City. And then you can find where your farmer's markets are when they are open and other things that might also be available in those markets too, like composting or textile drop off. But you also have the option too. sometimes a lot of these community centers or local small grocery stores will have something called community supported 
agriculture or a CSA program, which is a farm share. So they purchase and they get deliveries every week or every two weeks or so where the farmers will provide them with whatever is literally hot out of the gate and again, seasonally available. And sometimes they also deliver things like butter or milk or cheese or eggs like dairy products or maybe even fish and that sort of thing in addition to produce. And so you can go in on a full share if you have the room in your place to store all of these things and the budget to purchase that share. Or you can go in and split the cost of something like that with many of your neighbors or tenants or people within your building or in your family where you pick up that particular produce delivery and then you can split it up because I've done things like that in the past. And sometimes I'm like, I do not need this many onions today. And of course, as we are in New York City, you can hear some sirens in the background. So I apologize for any background noise. Um, lastly, like I was saying too, some restaurants or grocery stores are very committed to purchasing from local farmers. And so they'll have maybe a, sec a section or they'll have notes on something like this was grown in New York State. So, you know, just kind of being mindful to see how far something traveled, because that's another thing to take into consideration too. If we're relying on very places very, very far away, it's no longer considered quote unquote quote, local. So it might still be seasonal food available during certain times of the year, but it's coming from a little bit further away by truck, refrigeration, et cetera, et cetera. And that could add to the expense of something. And of course, to what is known as the carbon footprint, meaning that the emissions of traveling by truck is emitting pollution into the air and taking that into consideration when you make a purchase. If you have the luxury of space in your New York City dwelling, you can also grow some fruits and vegetables at home. Definitely herbs and some spices like basil plants or parsley plants. You can set them up on your windowsill or someplace that's a little bit sunnier. They need very, very little maintenance. So that's something that might be something to consider so that you're not paying for things that you can use in your home. Uh, from what I've read in our areas, herbs, like I just mentioned, basil, parsley, cilantro, etc. Tomatoes, peppers, and strawberries could also be viable in your home or apartment, or maybe even if you have, you know, a room or a courtyard in your um, backyard somewhere, as long as there is proper sunlight and the ability to maintain those things. So those do fairly well in this, these conditions too. Or if you know of a nearby school, or a church or even a community garden, which we have a ton of here in New York City, that you can either, I guess maybe they sometimes offer up parts of their land. It could be fee-based, it could be free. I'm not entirely sure how the programs work, but you can go and then pick your own stuff from there. So if you live like I do, we have, oh gosh, I think we have about six or seven down here in the East Village. So for me, within a five to 10 minute walking distance, if I wanted to, I could have a little plot of a community garden and I could make uh, whatever I wanted to plant some herbs, spices, flowers, whatever the case may be. And then I can go and get them on my way home from something. And it's very easily accessible to me. All right, next thing I want to talk about is the food safety and storage practices. So again, I mentioned in the, I mean, the older population, yes, but really anybody who might have an immune system issue or very young children, we want to make sure that we're not feeding them something that is expired or that contains certain food items that might be allergens, allergenic, so that they're going to have some sort of reaction to things. So obviously, we always want to make sure that we are reading our food labels, not just for allergens, if you are allergic to something, which obviously could be a very de detrimental reaction, could send you into the hospital or even worse, but also if you are managing a chronic condition where you do have to take into consideration things like salt and fat and sugar, excess amounts of sodium, excess amounts of saturated fat, or excess amounts of added sugar, that that's something you should be taking a look at. So I'm gonna share with you in the next slide in a second, the nutrition facts label, but I know we've looked at that a couple of times before too, so that might be something that is familiar to you. Also making sure, listen, if the pandemic has taught us anything, it's wash your hands. Wash your hands as often as possible, especially if you're going from task to task. So if you are touching something like raw chicken and then you're going off to make a salad, please make sure that you are washing your hands in between those two 
task. Make sure that you're also cleaning down your surfaces with some sort of soap product or a wind, not Windex, but like a Clorox or a bleach thing that can disinfect and sanitize what you are creating as far as the mess is concerned, but also anything that possibly might cause what's known as a cross contaminant. Uh, I do see something in the chat. Let me take a look. Oh, thanks, Donna. Thank you. I'm going to come back to that in a second. I'll read it out loud for anybody who might see that. Keeping foods separate. So we're talking about storage in your pantry, in your refrigerator, wherever you happen to be storing your foods. What we usually recommend are things that could be raw or leak or drip. Those are going to be placed on the very lower parts of your shelves inside your refrigerator so that if anything does leak down, it's not hitting on other things that are going to be affected. If you have things in your pantry storage closet, like we here in my apartment, everything's very small. So we don't have a lot of space to store things. Um, um, so we try to make sure if we have like cleaning products, for example, we're not putting them in the same cabinet as grain based foods or anything that might get contaminated or affected in that way. So please make sure just not not just the foods are keeping separated, but also if you happen to have cleaning products, disinfectants, chemicals, anything that could potentially spray or leak or get some get affected in some way. Cooking foods to appropriate internal temperatures. This is I'm I'm laughing in my head about this because I've mentioned to a lot of you before that I also am an adjunct professor up at Lehman College in the Bronx. And this semester I have been asked to cover a class for one of our pregnant professors and it is food service and food safety. So all of our students on Monday had to take a national exam to certify them as food service safety managers. So if they want to go work in commercial kitchens or work at a restaurant or you know start their own uh, cafeteria or whatever the case may be that they are now qualified to do that. And they had to memorize all of the different kinds of internal temperatures and the times and how to reheat food and how long to leave things out, et cetera. So I'm gonna share with you in a couple of slides, some resources as to where you can go to look some of that stuff up. But usually when you're dealing with certain foods, like especially if you, you prefer your foods cooked a little bit more underdone, right? Like rare or medium rare, we really do advise because bacteria can grow in those kinds of lower temperatures that we really do advise that if you have the ability to purchase a meat thermometer or a food thermometer, you do get one and just make sure that those internal temperatures have reached at least 145 degrees. That way they're more likely to kill off any bacteria and you then can avoid with, you know, getting affected by foodborne illnesses, which is never fun if anybody's had food poisoning. We also encourage you to re refrigerate food within two hours. So if something's sitting out, even if it's a can of beans, uh, not a can of beans, even if it's something like a bean salad or a potato salad or dairy based foods or a uh, cooked you know, chicken, anything like that that's sitting out for more than two hours. Again, it kind of goes into that, what's known as like a temperature danger zone. And that is where bacteria can start growing. And you might not even know that's the case. Now, I just want to side note this for a second, because if you're anything like me, I grew up with a family that was, um, they're, they're immigrants and they suffered famine and they had to escape war issues. And so they used to kind of just, uh, you know, if there was mold growing on something, they would just shave it off and eat the rest of the thing. I get it. I get that a lot of us have been trained to uh, not be wasteful with our food and maybe make accommodations like that. But I'm really going to encourage you, if you have the ability to throw that out, please throw it out. Because even if you cannot see that mold or that bacteria growing on the rest of that piece of cheese or the rest of that bread, it still has started um, int integrating into that particular food item. So even though you're cutting off what you can see, the threads of that bacteria or the spores of that bacteria are going back in. All right, let me jump into the chat. Donna says, Sunnyside has a farmer's market on Saturdays. Pantry items are great to purchase. However, vegetables from there do not last more than two days. Thank you, Donna. It seems like they sell veggies that they couldn't sell, right? So they're kind of giving you like repurposed things that are almost on their way out. Is there a place to look up the nearest community garden? Yeah, Donna, through grownyc.org, they have the uh, farmer's markets. And then if I'm not mistaken because they are part of um, New York like Parks and Rec. I believe that they also have the the uh, community gardens in that list as well. Or you can type in NYC, you know, community gardens. Um, I feel like it is tied into Grow NYC because again, it's Parks and Rec, I think that oversees that. I'll double check at the end of our conversation or if you feel like, you know, if you have the ability to check it up now and want to um, confirm that for me uh, while I'm finishing up the rest of this webinar, let me know. But if not, just remind me at the end of this conversation and I'll check it up for us. 
Okay, next on the list here. So again, going back to that reading your labels. So on the left-hand side, I've shared this with you in some of the webinars before of what you're looking at. So if you are managing something like heart health, um, high cholesterol, anything having to do with your cholesterol issues or fat issues, right? So saturated fats, um, dietary fats like eggs, butter, anything fried, et cetera. If you have the ability to look up or look at the back of the packaging, you can see the fat, the saturated fat and trans fats. Trans fats are technically illegal in America now. So you will probably never see them on the packaged food, but saturated fat could be an issue. That's the stuff that clogs your arteries. Cholesterol too, right? We talked about last month, we had cholesterol and heart health. So if you do see an item with cholesterol, again, you know, a little bit, not so bad, a lot, maybe a little bit worse, especially if you are already dealing with high cholesterol, because if you remember from our discussion last month, our liver makes cholesterol and sometimes you're eating more than your body can keep up with and that can put you at a higher risk of heart issues. And then you have things like the total sugars and the added sugars. I didn't put a little circle around this here, but the added sugar is the stuff that the manufacturer is putting in. The total sugars are naturally occurring. So as an example, like a banana, right? I've brought up this example, I think before. A whole banana would have about 19 grams of sugar. That's naturally occurring. But if I had a banana flavored yogurt or a fruit on the bottom yogurt with that syrup, in that, in that bottom area of that, that's gonna be a manufactured added sugar in there. So the banana flavoring could potentially come from natural bananas, but then they're adding in table sugar or creating a syrup, and then they're adding that to it. So if you're dealing with something like blood sugar issues like diabetes, that would be something you would be paying attention to. And then if you're able to make a, a healthier option, then when you get the food item home, you can sweeten it up on your own or add a little extra salt or you know drizzle something on it to season it. On the right hand side is what is known as now the top nine major food allergens used to be top eight. And then we entered in to that list back in 2021, I believe it was sesame. Sesame seeds are now on the top nine list of food allergens. So these are things that are very detrimental. If you have an allergen or an allergy, you're usually diagnosed with that very, very early on. But sometimes people have changes in things and they develop different kinds of allergies over the course of their life. If you have something like pollen, um, birch tree, ragweed allergies, that can be related to things like papaya or tomato. So there can be some issue there. Latex as well. If you have a latex allergy, it could be related to a food item because what you are allergic to is the protein in that food item. And as you can see here, it's both plants and animals. So you have things like sesame and nuts, different kinds of nuts, fish and shellfish, milk and dairy, et cetera. Okay, let me take a look at the chat here. Histamine intolerance and mast cell. Okay, Marnie, I'm gonna address that when we're done, but I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can give you some information about that. Thank you for letting me know, thank you. Yeah, some of those things are a little tricky because not all of us are um, qualified or trained in certain things like hormone uh, dysfunctions or issues like uh, allergies, unfortunately. Very, very challenging uh, situation or condition to have to manage as well. Okay, what do all these words mean, right? Use by, best by, sell by. So as a general rule, and again, I would just you know encourage you to make sure that you're opening a product, taking a look at things, making sure you look at that expiration date or asking your grocer to confirm something if you're unsure. But the words use by, best by, and best before are usually going to be stamped on a non-perishable food. So a non-perishable food means something that's not going to go bad very quickly. So these are like your packaged products like cereals or rices, grain-based items, canned foods like beans and soup, etc. These usually don't need to be refrigerated until you've opened up that seal. And now obviously, you know, you've compromised the integrity of that food. So then it has to be stored into a refrigerator once you've opened it up. So they're usually quote unquote safe to eat beyond the date. I was not able to get a confirmation as far as like how long beyond the date, um, as long as they've been stored properly. You know, I think again, war times and things and bunkers and stuff, some of that stuff is gonna be in there for years upon years. So my suggestion for this is we might see coming up in some of the slides is just rotate your inventory. And this goes back to 
what I think I was kind of getting out earlier, where if you do see things on sale, if you are buying in bulk, you know, try not to overdo it. If, uh, I mean, things are on sale all the time. So it's not like you're going to miss anything. And that's really the store's way of getting rid of their inventory to get more new, fresher things. So if you're ending up with a case of 24 cans or boxes of something and you have no plan for it, they're just going to be sitting in your pantry or your kitchen literally going to waste over the course of time. So I would prefer you try to budget accordingly, try to make some informed decisions when you go grocery shopping, purchase only what you need and rotate out that inventory so that things aren't sitting in your pantry or cabinets for 14 years later. Because again, meh, I don't know if I would be so keen on, on opening those up again, beyond the date with no, with no true definition on that. Okay. That bottom a uh, bullet that says sell by. Sell by is usually perishable foods like your packaged meats and cheeses and anything that's going to go bad. Here it does say it's okay to use for a few days after as long as it's stored properly as far as what kind of temperature or environment it's in. So if something doesn't necessarily need to be refrigerated, like some people don't refrigerate their eggs and that might be controversial, but sometimes it's somewhat acceptable to do so. Again, it might have to be in a cool, dry place like a pantry. You know, I'm looking for from where I'm sitting right now, I can see into my kitchen. We have, and maybe some of you are like this too, we have a stove top, right? Our stove and our oven right above it, our cabinets. So in those cabinets, and we have no exhaust fan, we have no way to temp temperature control when I'm doing cooking in there. So obviously all of the steam, the heat that's rising up from our stove top is hitting directly underneath and maybe even seeping into those cabinets. So I'm not putting anything in there that would be affected by that. So above that, stove in those cabinets are things like my plates and you know we have some like cat items and things like that for our uh for our and for our pet so i would probably say just be conscientious as to where you're storing things or make sure that you are putting things away appropriately in a refrigerated area okay some other things here if you are cooking and we're like this too there's only two of us in the home so we we try to eat as we go and try to get rid of as much food as possible without storing it for too long we also have a very 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 small refrigerator so we don't have a lot of room for leftovers as it is but if you do try to eat them within three to four days or if you're throwing them into a freezer again freezer burn can be an issue so try to write things put the date on when you're storing that to make sure that you can turn that over, go through inventory your kitchen every so often and use up what you have in there. If there are things in the pantry, like I mentioned here too, right? That what we call in the food service world, first in, first out, right? Kind of like in vending machine world too. And if you're anything like me, when we go shopping, we sometimes stick our hand all the way in the back to get the milk with the further expiration date because the stuff up front is the stuff that's going to go bad first. So that might be a little trick you might want to try. Place foods that could spoil quickly within sight. How many of you have opened your refrigerator and been like, oh dear, what is that in the back? I don't even recognize it, but I can smell it. So try to make sure that you are, again, inventorying your kitchen, cleaning out your refrigerator, moving things around, rotating as fast as possible or as regularly as possible, I should say. And sometimes this is something that people tend to do. They'll wash their produce, their leafy greens, their lettuces, their tomatoes, their strawberries, and then stick them back in the fridge. I would highly recommend against that. Make sure you wash right before serving. Unless you're doing something like you're drying it off and then putting it into a Tupperware with already used things, like you've created a fruit salad, right? You're making something that's like a prepared food that you're eating, or you're using a salad that might have some uh, dressing in it in some way to kind of uh, protect it in some way. But if you're having a head of lettuce brought in and you want to wash the leaves and separate them out and then stick them in the fridge, I would just say be really conscientious. Because again, in the food service world, there are a variety of factors that cause, especially produce items, but really anything that could be in your refrigerator to get bacteria and thereby causing foodborne illnesses. And those are things like acid forming, so acidity levels of food, temperature and time, how long something's sitting out and what temperature it's dropping to or going out of range. Also things like oxygen. So if something is not airtight sealed, the oxygen can come and start feeding that bacteria to grow. And then moisture is an issue too. So if you're drying something, washing something and then drying something off, there could be still some moisture or dampness on that produce item. And then eventually over the course of a couple of days, you'll start seeing some fuzziness on there. So we do recommend just to leave everything alone until you're about ready to eat it. All right, so here's one of the things I wanna share with you. Foodsafety.gov 
has, there's an app for it. There's an app for everything has something called food keeper app. So instead of me giving you a bunch of information and you have to like screenshot or memorize all this stuff, I would just say go to foodkeeper uh, food keeper app on the foodsafety.gov website. And in there, they have a variety of drop down categories and they'll share with you food and beverage, dry goods and you know perishable foods as well. And they'll share with you um, the storage duration to make sure that you're keeping food as safe and uh healthy, I guess, you know, making sure you're keeping it as protected as possible. So I really love this website. Um, and also I like anything that puts all those pretty colors of food on the top there. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the way, the ways that we eat, the consciousness and also the location and also the method of how we eat. So from left to right, think about where you're eating the most amount of meals or where you eat food? Is it at home? Is it at work or maybe off site in some way? Is it on the go? Whether you're traveling to someplace and from someplace, are you snacking or having to eat while you're in transit? Is it fresh? Is it frozen? Is it canned? We talked a little bit before about the peak of freshness and the nutritional value of having bought something that is locally grown or seasonally available, but there's no shame in the game of frozen or canned foods. As I mentioned, sometimes frozen is actually just as nutritious and quote unquote fresh as fresh foods is if it's picked and immediately packaged right away. The only thing I might, might recommend there is if you're looking again, if you're looking at the labels, just take a look at the ingredients list or the other information in that top section of the label, because maybe there is some added salt or added preservatives to keep things shelf stable. Or in the case of something that might be um, like, I'm trying to think like a frozen food item, like veggies, you know, those have those medleys, right? The vegetable medleys like peas and carrots and corn where they're chopped up. That's all you need is peas and carrots and corn. If there's a butter sauce in it and it's frozen, or if it has like a very high salt content in it, I might encourage you just to opt for something that is a little bit blander and then take it home and jazz it up on your own so you're not getting um, the, the higher end of the salt, the sugar, the fat. Canned foods, I'm all for canned foods. I do not have time sometimes to make things from scratch like soak beans and drain beans and cook beans. So I'll buy beans in a can. I'll buy tuna in a can. I'll buy soups in a can. But again, I'm looking at the back of the packaging as well to make sure that it is not full of extra salt or anything else that could be added in there. And really taking a look at the ingredients list too for anything that might that I might be a little bit sensitive to. Um, in the case of canned foods, a lot of times I'll opt for the low sodium version. And like I said before, I'll just doctor it up when I get home. I'll add a sprinkle of salt here. Usually packaged foods or foods that are made outside of your home are going to be much more heavily salted than you could possibly, I, I don't want to challenge you, but that you could possibly salt on your own when you're home, unless you're you know literally turning the salt container upside down and just letting it all fall with a giant pile of salt. Okay, the next one there with homemade versus store-bought. Sometimes we have to do semi-homemade things, and sometimes we have to just purchase things that were done for us. So think about things that you have control of, that you have the budget for, what you can make from scratch, the time you have available to do so. That would probably be ideal, but it's might it might not be realistic for a lot of people. Store-bought items, so going along the same kind of conversation I just had, things that are packaged, prepared, even things like, um, I'm trying to think like the deli section or they have like a salad bar, that's technically a store-bought item that could be considered a whole food or a close to whole food. Um, grilled roasted chickens are great too, right? They're done for you there. Sometimes they're very minimally seasoned anyway. They're just whole roasted chickens or like grilled fillets of fish. And again, it can save you some time. It might cost you a little bit more, but it's something that you don't necessarily have to put a lot of effort or energy into. Okay, let me check the chat. Oh, thank you, Donna. Thanks for putting that in there, much appreciated. And then on the right side, I don't know if I'm gonna include this in one of our future conversations coming up in one of our future webinars, but there is something about mindful eating and intuitive eating. In the older population, we do tend to see 
people not being able to kind of recognize their hunger and fullness cues. So in a case of something like that, right? So if you're unable to know, oh, I'm hungry or I'm thirsty, I usually would recommend setting an alarm or trying to create a schedule for yourself that you're getting up and making sure that you're having something to eat to make sure that you are nourishing yourself and fueling up your body so you're not passing out from hunger later in the day. And the fullness factor too. So if you're gobbling everything up very quickly, or you're, you know, you're eating in front of a television, there could be issues there as well, where maybe now you're over consuming, not just calories, but you're also eating twice as much salt or sugar or saturated fat. And you're not really paying attention to that either. So again, this whole concept of, you know, the beyond the table, it includes our behavioral factors as well of how we are bringing food into our homes, how we are bringing foods into our bodies, the choices that we are making, and of course, the way that we nourish ourselves, but also the way that we enjoy what we eat too. Okay, let's see. Oops, excuse me one sec. I think I just lost my little clicker. There we go. All right, so let's talk a little bit about some of the options that we may have. Again, think of your own personal life, what you do or do not do, who you may or may not have around you to assist with some of these things, the options that you may or may not have as far as resources are concerned. So we talked about homemade foods or preparing meals at home. And again, that could mean cooking from scratch, or it could just mean going shopping and kind of like setting up a plan for yourself as to what to eat throughout the week. I think we talked about meal plans planning in one of our previous webinars as well. But here is where you can have control over the ingredients of what you're putting into something that you're going to eat. And of course, thereby putting into your body, the amount that you are eating as well. So you're controlling the portions that you are going to digest as well as um, the cooking method too. So instead of having something that is deep fried, maybe you lightly saute something or you throw something in the air fryer. We don't have an air, we don't have space for an air fryer here, but I hear air fryers are pretty cool. You can also substitute ingredients, like I was saying before, with um, the low sodium options that I, I could add salt to it, but sometimes I'll add like hot sauce or something else, like a different kind of herb or spice to a food item that might be considered a little bit more bland. Or if I don't particularly like a specific ingredient, then I can... You know, I, I'm comfortable enough in the kitchen. I have somewhat of a culinary background. I feel uh, creative sometimes with what I'm doing when I feed myself. So sometimes I'll substitute and jazz things up if I'm making a food for myself. And then increasing the nutritional value. So preparing foods at home could also mean, you know, I ordered takeout, I ordered a pizza, but it's a plain cheese pizza and I have a whole bag of baby spinach. So I'm going to add some baby spinach and maybe I'll chop up some whatever, sliced chicken, use some of that roasted chicken and add that either as a side salad or I'll put it on top of my pizza. And now I've just increased the nutritional value of that. Give me one sec. Let me see in here. Oh, thanks, Marnie. I'm so glad I bring value to this. This is this is making my heart sing. Thank you so much. Planning your meals, right? I've said this over and over in the last couple of slides. I tend to have a theme every time we have these webinars of just being mindful of the food that we're eating, having an idea of what you're doing. Even like, I'm again, I'm looking at my kitchen here. We have a blackboard and I kind of lay out just like what what the schedule is, right? So on Sunday we go for bagels. So it's always bagels and then something for dinner. Like we'll do soup and a sandwich or something like that or soup and a salad or whatever. And then days that I'm working, I'll say, you know, I'm out all this, this night. And so my boyfriend is left alone to do whatever he wants to purchase or order or make or take leftovers from the fridge. But we have an idea of what we're gonna be using up in our home. Every Sunday, we do our grocery order based on the inventory of our kitchen. And again, because we have very, very limited space here, it's not like we're packing a lot of stuff to begin with. So we just do a quick little look around. Okay, we have a half a bag of lentils left over. I have some soup I haven't done yet. Um, I have some leftover um, veggie sausage in the freezer. Okay, let's put something together. I can even type into you know, a, a recipe generator online. What do I make with these three things? And boom, it, it'll give me some recipe options. So I can inventory my kitchen. I can use up what is already available so I'm not wasting food. And then I can make a list 
to replenish those staple items that I try to keep on hand quite often. I do shop sales. I do use some coupons, but again, I'm not really buying in bulk and I don't have a lot of space for a lot of stuff. But if I see something that's like two for the price of whatever, I'm okay with that. I cannot buy five pounds of oranges. I just can't. There's no place for me to put that stuff. But if you have the ability to um, you know, be more efficient with your purchases, but having a plan for it, like I said before, if you're bringing into your home or your apartment or your kitchen, a case of 24 of something, please make sure you know what you're doing with that. Or maybe you purchase it and you split it up. Like eight cans go to your friend, eight cans go to your sister, and then you keep the other eight cans. On the right hand side, depending on who you meet with, who you speak with, whether it's a social worker, a case manager, a therapist, a dietitian, anybody that can help put you in touch with resources that could potentially help supplement your need to purchase food or additional um, finances like Health Bucks or SNAP, which used to be known as food stamps. Now it's Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Food banks and pantries, sometimes they are open to the public and you just go in and shop around. There Again, no shame in that. There have been plenty of times where I've donated to places like that and plenty of times where I've had to go uh, to pick things up like that too. We are very fortunate, just as a side note, on our campus that we have a food bank there. We have a lot of donations coming in because we have a very underserved population in the Bronx and a very diverse group of students that are a wide variety of age ranges which with a wide variety of socioeconomic statuses that utilize the food bank. So they make an appointment and they can go in there for free and grab whatever, a grocery bag full of Oh gosh, I think we have a ton of stuff in there. Like we have grain-based foods, we have canned goods. Sometimes we even are lucky enough to get things like um, frozen fish or bags of shrimp and you know things that are quality proteins um, versus just the the packaged goods. Or sometimes we'll get produce as well, and we'll do you know things that will be more perishable. If you are a military person or a veteran, there could be also programs available for you to also supplement whatever you have and make sure that you are getting nutritious, dense, nutritionally dense food that is affordable and available to you. All right, let me check the chat. Naomi, I live in a very small apartment. I have an Instapot and bought a lid for it. That's an air fryer. It's a great way to make potato french fries without oil. Yeah, Naomi, that's a great, I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so our apartment, I mean, I'm I'm not gonna show it to you now. Maybe I, I'll take a picture of it and put it in one of the future webinars. We have 250 square feet in here. I don't know if anybody can beat that. And our kitchen is probably like four by four. Our we are in a renovated tenement in the East Village. So we have a lot of weird things with plumbing. So like our toilet is in one section of the apartment and our shower and sink, our wash basin is in another section of the apartment because at one point I think the toilet was shared by, you know, many tenants of the um, of the building. And so when they, you know, renovated, the plumbing still remained where it was. But the point I'm making here is that they left our kitchen kind of as is. And so our refrigerator is undermounted. So it's basically like maybe a, a, a little bit bigger than what would be considered like a college dorm refrigerator. So it is tight. Our our freezer, I think, is maybe the size of two shoe boxes side by side. So on top of that is a counter. And on top of that, we have our toaster oven. We have a Nutribullet. And I think that might be it. Like, I don't have, I don't know if I would ever have room. I had to give away some of my things too, because they just didn't fit in here. But I would love to try an air fryer, Naomi. So thank you for maybe making me consider that. Donna says, I don't know if this is true, but most major grocery stores get their fruits and veggies from a conglomerate called Appeal, created by Bill Gates and company. These products are genetically modified to last longer. Fruits and veggies usually not labeled as genetically modified. Donna, you bring up a good point because I might, I'm going to write that down. I might have a discussion in a future webinar where we talk about GMOs, um, a lot of pros and cons to them, and also a lot of kind of like preconceived beliefs and thoughts from the general population about like what exactly is it and why does it have to be that way. So obviously not to deter from our conversation today, but this does kind of tie into sustainability where we're trying to get longevity we're trying to make sure things don't raw and go bad or like if you're slicing an apple that it doesn't turn brown immediately that they have like an enzyme embedded in it so i'm kind of for some things like that but i would still love to know that there is transparency in labeling and so i'm going to get to this in a second about write your representative friends 
I mean, whether or not it's an election year, you always have the right to voice your opinion. The FDA, for those of you who are science nerds like I am, they hold like weekly and monthly open sessions where you can listen in and watch them do things like recreate the nutrition facts label and you can share your thoughts about that. That's how we got the nutrition facts label to look like it does now versus what it used to look like 10 years ago. So if you're curious about something like that, or if you want to share with Matthew too, if there's any topics that you think are kind of interesting, I'll make sure I include that in my list of some things maybe to include in a future webinar because GMO conversations can get a little bit derailed and there's a lot of information out there of the pros and cons of it. So thank you for, um, for noting that, Donna. Appreciate that. Okay, let's see. How am I doing on time? Another five minutes or so, Matthew, and I think I'll, I'll almost be done so you can um, share whatever else you need to do for, the, for our participants. All right, so let's take a look at sustainable measures and how to decrease food waste. Well, you know, begin with the end in mind, as is the case. Think about what it is that you're doing. Literally, every, not to make you all, you know, super anxious or uh, paranoid about everything, but literally every action you have has a reaction to it, right? So what are you doing as far as your imprint in this world, the choices that you make, the language that you use, the way that you act or react to whatever it is, whether it's food or your loved ones. In the case of food, because that's what our conversation is about today, you know, try to, again, try to use or buy only what you need or get creative with the leftovers and use them up as soon as possible. I want to talk a little bit too. I have a note on here because I kind of forgot um, some of the language that is used on this, but sometimes people will say like plant-based eating, right? So eat more vegetables. It's less problematic to the, um, the environment. And that is true. I mean, obviously, you know, any kind of procuring crop farming, livestock, whatever it is, there's going to be some sort of implication but we're talking about things like what are known as greenhouse gas emissions. So almonds used to come up a lot too. There was a whole issue with um, the droughts in California and how much water it takes to uh, procure almonds and be like an almond farmer. And there was a lot of, you know, back and forth with like, you think cattle ranchers are making the planet worse. You got to check out the almond farmers too. But Truth be told, meat production really does require an extensive amount of, first of all, grassland or grain. And some of, you know, some of us could also argue not all the animals are supposed to be eating those grain-based foods. They really are supposed to be out in the field and grass-fed beef, you know, that sort of thing. So that can be an issue. Emitting methane as they're digesting things, right? So the cows excrete and then those gases go up into the world and that can cause environmental issues too. Um, I'm reading through my notes here. Shrimp farms often occupy coastal lands. So they're again having to accommodate, you know, farming for fish in that sense. So that can also be um, absorbing or having issues with, you know, the carbon footprint of things like shrimp and prawns, et cetera, again, releasing into the atmosphere. But plant-based foods generally use less of that energy. So a hamburger could take quite a lot of energy, water, electricity, output of whatever, you know, the issues are with the methane gas versus something like an almond farmer would have to put out into the world. So again, I would probably always say err on the side of basing most of your meals around plants, just as far as an environmental standpoint, but also a nutritional standpoint, and then adding in the extra stuff and also diversifying your diet. Next month, by the way, next month, we'll talk about this in a sec. When we talk about gut health, we're going to talk a lot about diversifying your diet because your gut is going to thank you when you jazz it up, when you don't constantly eat the same things over and over again. All right, we talked too about buying foods in season, local from farmers when possible. It doesn't always have to be organic or anything like that. If your budget doesn't allow for it, you do whatever you need to do. And composting your scraps. So if, again, Grow NYC, again, that or, um, that website that is related to Parks and Rec and technically sanitation in this case as well, where we have composting of your scraps, dropping things off. If you are not doing that or if you don't have, I think some buildings now have like a brown bin that you can do that in your building. Um, we have a tiny little bucket and we drop it off on Sundays to our farmer's market here. Give me one sec. I just want to see in the chat. Um, Marnie, I, I, I don't know if I can actually answer that on a general basis. I would say, so how safe is it to eat at restaurants in terms of food storage and preparation? Okay, so 
we're going to, we, I actually have, Matthew, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I actually have a dining out webinar coming up in a few months, I think, where we're going to talk about things like the grades, like the grades that restaurants get. So if they have violations and they have been known not to follow proper food safety and storage policies, they obviously either get shut down, worst case scenario, or they'll get a food grade of like B or C or whatever. So I would always say I'd recommend, but I, I kind of want to deter you from doing this because sometimes it's like, you don't want to ever eat anywhere once you start reading about what some of the violations could be. I mean, sometimes they, you know, they can't control mice and things because it's New York City, but it, I'll give you the um, the website when we have that webinar as to where you can look up your your favorite restaurant or the places that you think you might want to frequent and take a look at their violations. Again, it might deter you from ever eating out again. So I'm going to just disclaim that. Okay. I just wanted to share a little personal note. So a couple of a couple of months ago, last month, um, I attended a compost teach-in. This was very, very interesting to me because I am all for being green. Like I want to do my part for the planet. And so we've been composting for years and years and years. But the way that I understand what's happening here on the left-hand side, these are these new compost bins. You have an app. You actually have an app that when you walk towards it, you can open the bin and you can drop off your banana peels, your onion peels, whatever, your scraps of food in there. On the right hand side, so similar to what some of you were asking me before about where do we find community gardens, etc. You can also find compost bins on that same kind of drop down menu on grownyc.org, I believe it is. And so it was just interesting to see kind of like the timeline of who the organizations and also a lot of volunteers that were involved in creating these compost um, programs in the city, but unfortunately, right. So we, again, we're trying to do a lot of green greening of things. We want to make sure we're sustainable. We want to do our part to have a, a better, um, land, especially since it's New York, there's a lot of, you know, fumes and things that are going around here, but we're trying to have better spaces for our current and future generations. But it's not just about us as the residents dropping off our compost. It's about what happens after the fact. And it was just so interesting to see, you know, who gets contracted to come and pick up the stuff and then who gets contracted to have to turn that stuff into something else whether it's fertilizer or they're burning it or what however it gets turned into whatever the next step is also because it's such a large pile of composting um some parks were saying hey you can drop it off here and we'll have a little separate section and then one by one they started saying we don't want to do that anymore it's kind of ugly looking so unfortunately for those of you who do pay attention to stuff like this again this is another reason why i say advocate and get involved in things is because um, the mayor and those powers that be did kind of put a kibosh on stuff and they were cutting or they were thinking of cutting funding to community composting. So here we have this wonderful plan in action and we're all wanting to do our part and then wah, wah, they might take it away from us. So I really encourage you and I'm cutting it close to the end of our conversation here, but I'm really encouraging you to think of how big or how small you can Think of what you want to do next. You might not be able to save the world or the planet, but some small changes that can both personally affect you, but also affect maybe the people around you as well. And making sure that you are supporting whoever it is, right? We work in concentric circles. Who's in your neighborhood that you can talk to? Your grocer, your farmer's market, people that you might want to go in on a farm share with and do something to support your local farmer, or just make more conscientious choices when you're at the supermarket, whatever it is that you can do, whatever you want to do, you know, a, a little bit goes a long way, as I like to say, please don't ever think that your efforts are not going to be benefiting something or someone they really will they really will so i thank you all i'm going to go look in the chat in a second and if you have any questions obviously you can drop them in and then just a little teaser for next month's webinar like i mentioned we're going to talk about the gastrointestinal system and how to support our gut health on thursday april 11. okay i'm taking a look at the chat in here i uh, thought true yeah go ahead i have a question for you so yeah um, going around uh, the Bronx and, and Manhattan, I do see that smaller supermarkets now have quite extensive organic sections. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, uh, price is always an issue for most people. Yeah. Is there anything in terms of organic that maybe makes more sense than other products? Yeah, I would say if it's so we're talking about 
we always talk about dosage and toxicity. How much toxicity is there in pesticides and how much are we eating of that? And then to put things in a, a larger view, um, if you're buying organic blueberries, but smoking and drinking alcohol and not getting proper sleep and breathing in the fumes of New York, that's not gonna solve your health problems. But if you're really conscientious about that, I would usually say err on the side of anything that is edible as the outer shell or the outer peel. So things that you are not peeling, like in the sense of apples, technically you don't have to peel an apple. You don't have to, you know, you're eating grapes, you're eating strawberries. There's no peel on that. Those you could opt for the organic version because they're going to be a little bit more, a, a lot lower in pesticides. There are still obviously um, pesticide um things that are done, but they're done in an organic way. So they're not using synthetic toxic chemicals to avoid pests and things like that versus something that you would, pe so, you know, we had this whole conversation about eating banana peels a while back, but I was going to say things like bananas, avocados, um, pineapples, things with a heartier outer shell that you're going to get rid of. You can buy those conventionally because anything that's being sprayed on them is not going to penetrate through to the inner flesh. So you're going to be getting rid of that. So save your money for the kind of like the more delicate type of produce. And if it makes sense to you, you know, nowadays, it could be a difference of like $4 difference of this versus that. Um, or sometimes if it's in season and it's organic, maybe it's just a, a $1 difference. Does that answer your question, Matthew? Yes, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And if anyone else has any questions too, I'm happy to answer. Donna, I'm looking at your note in here, right? The live like a bat because the apartment's so dark and this is wonderful. Okay, the arrow gardens. Oh, that's so fun. That's so fun. Second for lettuce. Okay, good, good. Oh gosh, if we didn't have a crazy cat, I would definitely have a bunch of things in here. Not that he's gonna eat it, but he's gonna just knock everything over and there would be dirt everywhere. Um, I love that. Uh, I just wanna address, so Marnie, again, as I don't know your particular situation with the histamine discussion, but I would say um, eatright.org, eatright.org is the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics and they have a find a dietitian there or you could inquire with like an endocrinologist they might have somebody who is a little bit more savvier with a dietitian who is aware or even functional functional medicine um, specialists again I don't want to give too much advice because I don't know your particular situation but it's possible that you could look at somebody who has that particular um, specialty if that's helpful Marnie. Thanks for all of your questions and comments. This has been super fun, everyone. I appreciate the time spent together here. And thanks, Matthew. Oh, Matthew, I think you're still muted. Sorry. Thank you, Dina. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. And uh, you would think I would know after all these Zooms. Um, Rick, rookie but, mistake. <laughs> thank you, uh, everyone, for attending. Uh, please look uh, for next month event with Dina. It should be on our events page soon if it's not up there already. And as I mentioned earlier, we have two events next week you might want to tune into, one on health literacy and one on blood cancer uh, basics. And with that, we'll say goodbye to everyone till next time. Take care.